I want to start out with this quote from Chief Seattle. I, I really admire the Native Americans in many ways, and I, they are very close to nature. Anyway, he says, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one strand within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. That's a really profound statement. These people were very close to nature and uh, much closer than I am and most of us, I think. Well, since um, Susan and I, Susan Young and I sort of came up with this idea of the circle of life, it's made me think about circles for a minute. So I just want to go through these briefly, circles. Uh, I've always actually liked astronomy. And this is a picture of our sister uh, galaxy to the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy. And if you look at the Andromeda Galaxy, a uh, fascinating object in itself, it's circular. And then if you look at our sun, which is also a fascinating object, uh, it's also circular. And if you look at the Earth, it's also circular. I mean, there's something odd about the universe that there's so many circles. And then our moon is circular. But most of what the European Americans do is not circular. The American Indians designed their homes to be circular. Has anybody here ever been in a teepee? It's a great thing to be in. It's really, I've had friends that have made teepees and lived in them for years. They're really a beautiful home. A yurt, this is, I guess, in Mongolia or someplace. I didn't take the picture, obviously. Uh, I did have a, the pleasure of being in a yurt once up in Mongolia. And it's also an extremely restful place. The something about a circular home is, is very fascinating. And I'm not sure exactly where it is that we decided to make everything square, everything straight. This is the American style, which is, you know, make subdivisions, square homes, straight lanes, everything sort of boxy and cookie cutterish. I'm not sure if that does something to us. It, it may. Anyway, um, my wife and I bought a small property out in West Fork, Arkansas. And this is a picture just April 12th of Jane walking across the pasture, and the trees are all coming into leaf. And we've been learning a lot about nature on this property. That's the other thing is nature is this inexhaustible, infinite thing. Um, it's nobody knows all about the plants or all about the insects or all about the birds. Nobody, not me, no one. It's a lifelong experience. And um, there's also dangers in nature. Unfortunately, my wife, we have a lot of ticks on this property, and my wife is fighting Lyme disease. And it's a serious problem. And it's, it's, uh, that's, that could be a whole talk in itself is Lyme disease. But anyway, the spring trees are leafing out. It's a beautiful place, and there's a lot to learn. The other point about this is the Ozarks are an amazing place natural history-wise. We're sort of not too far south, we're not too far north. We got a lot of interesting plants and animals here. So I have some principles I thought I'd point out. Um, one is, I just pointed out, I am definitely on a learning curve, and I know I won't learn everything in my lifetime. A very important point is diversity is more than good. It is essential. Humans are tending to simplify life and to remove diversity, but diversity is essential for us. I also think plants and animals have the right to exist on their own merits. A lot of times people are always saying, well, what good is this bug or what good is this bird? And that's always from our point of view. Well, who made us the arbiters of everything? Um, I think plants and animals have a right to exist on their own merits. But in addition, many plants and animals do have value to humans. More and more we find that most plants have some compound that might be useful medically or for, you know, for nutritional purposes. But so many of them do. We don't want to lose them. Now, President Ronald Reagan once had the quote. This is, I, I wasn't able to find an exact source, but I remember he did say it, that greed is good. I don't believe that greed is good. I don't think it's good in humans, and I don't think it's good in animals and plants. And one of the things I find with invasive plants is that they're greedy. Invasive plants will take over everything and leave nothing for the other plants. So I disagree, both for humans and plants and animals. And as the Indian said, uh, all things on earth are connected. But you and I can have a positive impact, even if it's a small one. I, I remember reading once that there was an ancient Jewish saying that if you save one life, you've saved all of humanity. I think the same is true for plants and animals. Um, and I'm not talking about the species. I'm just talking about if you can actually save one wildflower that's rare, 
on your property, you've done a good thing. And I'm trying to do that with certain plants and animals. So you can have an impact just if you just save one individual plant. Now, this is an example of human simplification. This is at the Pennies at the mall in, in, um, at, at Fayetteville. Now, these things may be necessary. I don't know. But we have covered up a lot of the planet with us. We really have. And that's what I call simplification. That actually is not an environment which is good for anything. The butterflies, the birds, the plants, it is not. And, and I, as a beekeeper, I'm always looking for what's good for the bees. And there's another one. This is a, a, one of the developments up near Pennies. And those are very artificial environments. Uh, the plantings don't have the kind of density and structure which is good for wildlife. And so I don't know how many of you got to see Doug, Rick, Rick Dark. He came and spoke here in Springdale. Excellent speaker. One of the best I've ever heard. He, he kept us interested for like six hours. He talked and talked. And this is a great new book by him and my friend Doug Tallamy called The Living Landscape. And one of the things that's very important about this is that he talks about the value of layers. Even I fall into this group. You know, you get a plant, you plant this plant all by itself. And that actually is not very beneficial to the birds and insects. They need layers. So like they need a canopy, they need a shrub thing, and an understory. And that's most of, if you look at most landscapes, you'll see specimen plants and trees. Just a plant planted by itself. And they need denser areas, uh, especially don't need invasive shrubs and plants. So, um, uh, this is an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Now, I took this picture this morning. <laughs> this is, I hope my neighbor is not here. This is directly <laughs> across the street from me. And they're very nice people, and they planted their yard in the typical way. They put in uh, a specimen that looks like a spruce. I'm not sure what they planted in here, but they planted three specimen trees, and they have a couple of specimen plants over here. And this is their other side of their yard. This is, this is what I, my view they're nice people. They've done a good job making a, a new, they renovated the house and added to it. But this yard is actually not very useful for li wildlife of any sort. Not the insects, the butterflies, the birds. Now, this is unconscious. This is my yard. <laughs> and, and we're one of those ones where the people probably don't like us, our neighbors. This is mostly my wife's doing. She, she one time loved roses, so she planted a lot of roses. not in bloom yet. When they're in bloom, they're actually very beautiful. And... Um, we have a lot of density in there. It's kind of rough and tangled up looking. And we've learned a lot too. Like I, 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 When I first moved to this house in 26 years ago, it's in Wilson Park in Fayetteville, we had a gigantic bush honeysuckle plant in our yard, really a monster. And I didn't realize at the time myself that that was an invasive, exotic plant and should not be in the landscape. It took me a lot to cut it down, but I finally did cut it down. I've now since learned Every bush honeysuckle should be taken out of the landscape if you could do it. Every single one and every ailanthus tree and um, many other invasive plants. So I have a couple little stories I'd like to tell you. The first one is what do rough green snakes have to do with anything? Does anybody know what a rough green snake is? There we got one. They're a beautiful snake. Um, and I'll show you a picture of one. It's not the greatest picture. That's a rough green snake. It's a native to Ozarks. I saw that on our West Fork property. I thought it was a vine. I was, gonna, I was even going to grab it. And then I realized it's this absolutely beautiful green snake. And it lives up in the trees. It's a tree snake. And it eats spiders, caterpillars, grasshoppers, and other insects. So it's this beautiful snake on our property. So uh, actually a valuable part of the ecosystem. But anyway, I'm going to tell you a little story based on this. This is the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, one of our native, uh, native swallowtails. And I took this picture also, um, actually I took this one in my backyard because I planted a spice bush one year, and then these caterpillars came, the, the, the butterflies came and laid their eggs, and the caterpillars ate my spice bush to the ground. Does anybody know what a spice bush is, by the way? A totally beautiful native plant, worth planting, worth having. I'm going to show you that. But anyway, this, this butterfly, the caterpillar, only eats spice bush and sassafras in our state. If you have spice bush and sassafras, you can have spice bush butterflies and you can contribute to their population. A totally beautiful little creature. And what are these things here? Fake eyes. It looks like a little snake. It makes a little, little circular tunnel in a spice bush leaf and it looks out from that and if a bird comes along, it sees those big eyes 
It's real eyes are way down here and little tiny things. It looks like a little snake and it's supposed to mimic the snake. That's what they say. Anyway, it's a beautiful caterpillar in its own right. A happy little sight. And there's the pupa. I found this one at Kings River Falls. Uh, it's the pupa of a spice bush swallowtail. They overwinter as pupae and in the early in the spring they emerge. Very delicate stage for the, the butterfly. Also a beautiful thing in its own right. And then it turns into this butterfly, the adult spice bush. And um, it's a mimic of another butterfly called a pipe vine swallowtail. So there's a whole bunch of butterflies which are edible that mimic other butterflies that are not edible. And if you look at butterflies much, you'll often find there's a beak-shaped mark out of its wing where a bird has tried to capture it. It's very, very common to see damaged butterflies which have survived by the bird trying to eat the wing, grabbing the wing, and the butterfly escapes. Okay, so now I'm going to try to link these things together a bit. This is Forsythia. I took this picture this spring at my own church, unfortunately. And um, how many like Forsythia? A lot of you like it. <laughs> I like Forsythia too. But it's actually a useless plant aside from looking good. Um, it's pretty yellow color. I'm not saying you shouldn't have it. It's not highly invasive, so it's not the worst thing in the world. But, you know, the bees don't go to it. The pollinators don't go to it. It, it, it doesn't seem to be invasive because it doesn't seem to have abundant seeds or a bird distribution. So in place of forsythia, I recommend spice bush, which is our native plant, and it's the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail. It's a really beautiful plant. It's not as showy, but it's a delicate, elegant, beautiful plant. It's fragrant. So if you've got the chance, pull up your forsythia and plant a spice bush. The thing is, I'm not saying you should pull up all your forsythia, Although some plants I think you should kill on site. I really think Bradford pears should be removed <laughs> on site. Every one of them. No, really, they should. They're a useless plant in the ecosystem. They're actually harmful. And they're all over. If you go out in the spring, you'll see tens of thousands of them up in northwest Arkansas. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm saying is this is a better plant for our ecosystem than a, than a forsythia, and it's equally pretty. Now, it's, it is delicate. This shows it in the woods. It's much more airy. It's not as big as showy. And it produces uh, berries, which the birds love in the fall. It's a wonderful plant. I mean, um, it, it's, it's got everything going for it, uh, in my opinion. And there's another spice bush um, swallowtail at Nine Stone on um, some Coreopsis. A beautiful butterfly. Now, it, this butterfly, the spice bush swallowtail, is a mimic of this butterfly. And they look quite similar. This is a pipe vine swallowtail. And it's on, well, does anybody know what that plant is? I guess I say it's button bush, button bush out at Woolsey Wet Prairie. And if you haven't been to Woolsey Wet Prairie, which is a Fayetteville natural area, fantastic place to go. It's a wet prairie, unlike a dry prairie. It's loaded with interesting plants. And button bush is another native plant well worth planting in your landscape. So I'm trying to link these things together. We had a green snake, we had a caterpillar, we had spice bush. Now we have the pipe vine swallowtail. And the pipe vine swallowtail, only, its caterpillars only eat one plant in our landscape, and that is Aristolochia, the pipe vine, which is an unusual, I didn't take this picture, unfortunately, I don't have any of these growing well, but this is also a beautiful plant, well worth planting in your landscape, because it's the food for this butterfly, and uh, they also have these very unusual flowers, which apparently trap flies to pollinate them, and then let them go after they pollinated them, <laughs> and this is a native plant which should be planted widely in our landscape instead of some of the other vines we see in our, in our landscape. And this is not my picture either, but this shows a pipe vine over this person's uh, uh, um, bench. And um, if you plant pipe vine, you will get pipe vine swallowtails, the caterpillars, and then you'll have the adults. So native plant, which is beautiful, worth planting. And this is uh, not my picture either, I haven't, but this is the larvae of the pipe vine swallowtail. So its stages are also poisonous to birds. And that's, that's what we call, as entomologists, aposomatic. It's warning other animals, do not eat me. And if you look at those caterpillars, they look kind of like you wouldn't want to eat them. <laughs> if, if you see a pipe vine swallowtail, you know someplace in the landscape there's pipe vine, because that's the only thing they eat. But what do we have mostly in our landscape? We have a, a Japanese honeysuckle. A uh, Japanese honeysuckle, a lot of people like that vine. It smells good in the spring, but it smothers our native vegetation. It's a highly invasive plant. should be also removed 
on site. It's almost a Herculean task. To remove this from our landscape might be impossible. Uh, there's some of our native honeysuckles, which are totally beautiful. They're good for hummingbirds. They're not invasive. Our native plants are so much better than these exotic plants. Another plant which is common in, in northwest Arkansas is English ivy. This is in Wilson Park, grows up these trees. It will, it's a very harmful plant. Some people still buy that stuff and put it out, but it's a totally destructive, non-native. In Oregon, they've made it illegal, and they're trying to remove it because it's very harmful for our trees. Uh, this is not my picture, but this is kudzu. If you, go, if you drive out to Lake Weddington, you'll see some big areas of kudzu. This is also a serious exotic menace. So what we're doing is we've displaced our beautiful pipe vine with things like kudzu, English ivy, Japanese honeysuckle. Now, um, just a couple more pictures of our invasive plants. Um, this is the Frisco Trail in Fayetteville, which goes uh, along Wilson Park down to Dixon Street. And this is in winter, December 9, 2013. This is all bush honeysuckle, privet, euonymus, and English ivy, all still green in the middle of winter. And that shows you one reason why they overpower our native plants. They stay green all winter, and they leaf out very early, and they smother everything else. If you want to start learning to what bush honeysuckle looks like, you'll see that it is everywhere. And this is privet berries, same day, December 9, 2013. These privet is another invasive, noxious plant covered with fruits, which the birds eat and then distribute widely. If you go out walking miles from Fayetteville, you'll find privet, bush honeysuckle, Osage, uh, sorry, um, uh, multiflora rose. You'll find these things out in the deep woods because the birds are carrying these berries and seeds everywhere. So anyway, it just shows you again, even in the middle of winter with snowfall, uh, these invasive plants are still green. And they have a leg up on our native plants. Bush honeysuckle produces enormous numbers of fruits, which are not very nutritious for the birds, but the birds will eat them because there's not much else, and they'll carry them and drop them everywhere. Um, that's all bush honeysuckle in, in along the Frisco Trail. It's miles of it. And there it is in bloom. I'm a beekeeper. I've only seen a bee on bush honeysuckle once. They don't like the nectar. They don't like the pollen. So you get these vast areas of um, bush honeysuckle. And there, I like, to, I like to open up berries and see what's inside them or fruits. And there's the, there's the seeds of bush honeysuckle. So this watery fruit gets eaten by a bird. The bird defecates that miles away into the forest. And you now have a patch of bush honeysuckle. Just, just to point out this, I went canoeing on the Buffalo River, and all along the Buffalo River I saw tons of ailanthus trees coming in. And if they don't take them out, soon our national forest will be all ailanthus. So anyway, this is part of how it works. Now getting back to the swallowtails, uh, this is our native tiger swallowtail, which eats wild cherry and um, tulip poplar. Again, native plants, beautiful insect. And it has a, a, a double form. The females can be dark, and they also mimic the pipe vine swallowtail. So we see all these dark swallowtails, which are mimics of the pipe vine swallowtail. That's also on button bush at Woolsey Wet Prairie. So another advantage of our native plants, in addition to supporting our caterpillars, is their berries are good for the birds. They truly are. This is an American holly, and migrating robins and cedar waxwings eat on these on the, when they're migrating through, and they need that for their, their ability to survive the winter. How many of you have an American holly in your, in your yard? Do you have one out at your place? No? American hollies are one of the most beautiful plants in the world. They form a very tall, spire-like plant. If it's in good condition, it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and then dogwoods are also, uh, you know, the flowering dogwood is... I mean, I watch the robins when they're migrating. They just go crazy eating dogwood fruits. And they'll spread them, which is good. Dogwood is not a highly invasive plant. It's native. And there's caterpillars that eat it. Um, okay, so going... So I talked a little bit about invasive vines. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about invasive shrubs. Um, this is Nandina, called heavenly bamboo. It's native to Eastern Asia. How many of you have Nandina in your landscape? You know, it's a learning experience. When I... <laughs> First, I, I planted some Nandinas myself. And um, it's got a pretty attractive berry fruit. And cedar waxwings will eat 
this is not a cedar we're actually eating in Andina, but they will eat them. They love holly berries, red cedar berries, hackberries, but they will eat Nandina. Does anybody know what the problem with Nandina is? The whole plant is poisonous. And people are finding that Nandina uh, berries and cedar waxwings will actually kill them. So, so here's another plant. To me, it, Nandina is not a good plant for butterflies. It's not a good plant for bees. And it's not good for the birds. We got America, I mean, we got like our, our, our native flowering dogwoods, which have beautiful red berries. We've got our hollies. Why would anybody plant Nandina? And again, I think if you've got one, cut it down, put in a, a holly, put in a dogwood. Um, I, I mean, this is all learning things. I didn't know five years ago that this one was killing birds. Okay, the last, I think the last swallowtail I'll talk about is the zebra swallowtail. When I was a boy, I used to read about swallowtail, zebra swallowtails, and I would have practically died to see one. Um, but we're blessed with them here. There are a lot of zebra swallowtails in our state. And they are a total specialist on pawpaw plant, which is another good plant to put in your landscape. Pawpaw has edible fruits that we can eat. The animals like them. And it's the only food plant for zebra swallowtails. And if you go around Fayetteville or Springdale, I bet you won't see a whole lot of pawpaws or spice bush in the landscape. That's my guess. And pawpaw is a very unusual, beautiful flower. This is a picture I just took last week uh, down in Wilson Park. They have a little natural area. It's a it's a, a fly beetle pollinated flower, but very beautiful in its own right. So anyway, if you want zebra swallowtails, you plant pawpaw. Okay, now another plant that's related to one other swallowtail I want to talk about is wafer ash. I've only seen wafer ash in nature twice. I saw them at Nine Stone, and I also saw them once along the Buffalo River. It's got relatively small but very fragrant green flowers that are pollinated by flies. Its seeds used to be used as a substitute for hops and beer by our, our settlers, so they called it a hop tree. And that's a, a wafer ash. And there's the flowers up closer. It's in the citrus family. It's an unusual citrus that grows naturally in Arkansas. And it's not very showy flowers. And the seeds are very interesting. I love the seeds. Um, they look like little pennies. And that's why they call it a wafer ash. But it's a citrus. And I've been, I just like looking at them and seeing them, and I've been planting them. So there's one I planted. Judy Griffith at Nine Stone gave me some seeds, and I planted them out at our property and hoping some of them will grow up. But why plant a wafer ash? It's a native plant that's not that common. It belongs in our landscape, has fragrant flowers, produces these beautiful winged seeds, and it's the primary host for North America's largest butterfly, the giant swallowtail. I want to digress on this for a minute once more. Why should everything we plant be <laughs> showy and massive flowers? Um, why do we always have to think, can we use this in some way for our own benefit? So this little plant is not that showy, but it produces caterpillars of the orange dog. Uh, my friend Beth Lowry loves these caterpillars. Um, they put out these osmateria, which kind of stink. The caterpillar itself is supposed to look like a bird dropping to avoid predation. <laughs> and it's also sort of a snake mimic. And uh, you can't see it very well. This is at Nine Stone, but there shows a, a giant swallowtail uh, out in their meadows. And this is a picture I took on my land of a giant swallowtail uh, feeding on... I forget now. What did you say? Say? I think so, yeah. Anyway, this is, this is a, unfortunately, this is a low-resolution picture. I am so happy with that picture. That is the biggest swallowtail in North America. Its host plant is wafer ash. If you plant wafer ashes, you're helping the population of giant swallowtails. They're one of the most dramatic butterflies in the world. You know, so I'm trying. I'm, it's like a learning trip. You know, I'm trying to go through our landscape and replace anything that's noxious with something like wafer ash or something which has a purpose for butterflies, birds, and it's beautiful, too. You just have to adjust your eyesight. Anyway, that's a great butterfly. Plant wafer ash. You might help that butterfly. And it's beautiful in its own right. It has fragrant flowers. Okay, so a summary of this story is green snakes eat spiders. There's a caterpillar. The spice bush caterpillar mimics a green snake, which produces a butterfly that pretends to be a poisonous swallowtail butterfly, the pipevine swallowtail. And it shows how important our native trees, shrubs, and vines are to butterflies. 
And then, in addition, their fruits are good for our mi migrating overwintering birds. Unfortunately, plants like Mandina and exotic Aristolochia, sometimes people like there's some beautiful exotic Aristolochias. They'll actually kill pipe flying swallowtails. By the, they're too toxic. So these things are not good for our birds or our butterflies. We are really lucky to have twice bush swallowtails, pipe flies, tigers, zebras, giant swallowtails. So my take-home message is plant spice bush, pawpaw, sassafras, wafer ash, instead of forsythia, nandina, and so on. Okay, I don't know. I don't want to take too much time. I'm gonna, I guess I'll tell one. I'll tell a couple more stories real quickly. This one is when is a weed not a weed? This one's a very common story. Most of you recognize that this is the monarch caterpillar. Monarchs are milkweed specialists. They have to have milkweeds. Unfortunately, we called them milkweeds. You know, when you label somebody as a pest or obnoxious, you can label people, which the Nazis did with the Jews and the Gypsies. You can label them and say they're no longer worth anything. Calling a milkweed a weed is a bad idea. It's not a weed. It's a native wildflower. There's many species. Monarchs are specialists on them. This is a picture I took of a monarch pupa once. If you've ever, has anybody seen a monarch chrysalis? It's one of the most beautiful things in nature. You know, it's this jade green. It's got these little gold spots, these little silver spots, these little black spots. It's a beautiful piece of art. And it turns into the, one of the most dramatic, majestic butterflies in the North America. And here's a pair I took out at the research farm uh, mating on their flight down to Mexico. You know, one thing I like to point out is all insects are just like you. Honeybee, butterflies are just like you. They need food, they need water, they need air, they need mates, and they need habitat. They're, they have to have the same things we have to have. One, one of the dramatic things about monarchs, in addition to being one of the most majestic butterflies, is that they have this migration which takes all the monarchs from east of the Rockies down to a, a, a forest in Mexico for overwintering. This whole thing, this whole phenomenon is at risk now. Does anybody know why it's at risk? Excuse me? Logging is the overwintering, but what's the risk up here? We've put in hundreds of millions of acres of lawns, asphalt, buildings, monoculture crops, herbicides, and there's no longer as many milkweeds for them to eat. This is the monarchs down overwintering in the Mexican forests. And all along that trip, they have to have nectar from Minnesota down to Mexico. They have to have nectar every couple hundred miles to make it as their fuel, just like we do. When you go on a trip, if you couldn't find a gas station when you're going on a long trip, you would run out of gas. They need to have flowers all along that trip, both going and coming back up. And so um, this is on Budlia, which a lot of people think is invasive, but, but it is a great nectar source for migrating monarchs and fall butterflies. But so if you can plant nectar flowers which bloom in the fall, you'll help the migrating population. And then if you plant milkweeds in your garden, you'll help them on the way uh, for their larvae. This is swamp milkweed. How many of you have swamp milkweed in your property? There's one, two. Three, it is such a beautiful plant. That's one of our native milkweeds. It's this gorgeous shade of pink. It's unbelievably beautiful. And the honeybees like it. The monarchs like it. So I've been trying to increase milkweeds in my garden as much as I can. That's why I gather the seeds. I plant them all over and try to increase them. Marianne King at Pine Ridge Garden sells almost all of these things. Uh, Susan Fry, who sells at the farmer's market, She's a, a graduate of the horticulture department. She's been selling plants. Other people are starting to produce native plants. The other thing you can do is gather the, the milkweed pods yourself, spread some of them around where you found them, and then also you can stratify them and try to plant them uh, in your garden uh, later. This is another one of the species that's native, purple milkweed. How many of you have ever seen a purple milkweed? Have you? It's amazing. It forms this big purplish globe flower. I've saved some of them where I saw roads were going to destroy them, and I get their seeds, and I try to plant them around. I'd like to have hundreds of these plants in my landscape. And of course, butterfly weed, which most of you do know, is also a good one for the monarchs. So anyway, a milkweed is not really a weed. It's a member of the genus Asclepius. We have many species of milkweeds. They should be in every garden, which would help the monarchs survive. You can watch the monarch life cycle. They have their own value, 
and they provide a lot of beauty to us. Um, also, planting nectar-bearing patches of flowers in the fall, like asters, goldenrod, milkweeds, or even zinnias and budlia, will help the monarch survive. Now, if you can help a monarch survive, if you've done nothing else in your life, you've done something good in your life. And if you can save a purple milkweed and help them to survive, you've done something good. Um, I, I feel like uh, I, I've done a lot of wrong things, but if, if I can say, well, I did help the purple milkweeds in northwest Arkansas, or I helped swamp milkweeds, or the monarchs, or the swallowtails, I may have done something good with my life. So this is another story. People like silk and think silk dresses are pretty. And they come from the oriental silkworm, which is a whole other story. These are, I've raised these before. These come from China. All of our commercial silk comes from these. And 20 million people in China raise this caterpillar in order to produce the silk the world wants. And it, it's been this beautiful cocoon. Also, it's supposedly invented by an old, ancient, 5,000-year-ago um, Chinese princess. The whole idea of spinning silk from a cocoon. Anyway, there's cocoons. A big business in China and a big business here. But more beautiful to me than silk clothing are our native silk, silk moths. This is a cecropia moth, which is one of our natives. How many of you have ever seen a cecropia moth in life? Yeah, one, two, three. You haven't seen one? Or you have? It's an awesome creature. They only live one week as an adult. They don't ever feed as an adult. They only have one thing on their, well, two things on their mind. This is a female. She sits there and she wafts out her pheromone perfume, and the males of her species can find her in the dark from several miles away by the concentration of her perfume. And then after she's mated, she has to use her antennae to find correct host plant to lay her eggs. But to me, there's something special about so much beauty being produced only live one week. And there's the caterpillar, the cecropia, a great thing to have. Um, feeds on willow and dogwoods, other plants. A beautiful creature in its own right. It spins a very rough cocoon, which protects it in the winter. And at one point, I was going to out at this moment, April 15, Probably the whole Earth's entire population of cecropia moths are in their cocoon as pupae. If something happened to them, we'd lose that species uh, for good. If you open up the cocoon, you can see the pupa. Uh, 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 the metamorphosis of monarchs and swallowtails and cecropias is beyond belief. That you can have this egg, then a caterpillar, that then turns into a pupa, and it completely reorganizes and becomes that beautiful moth. Is Really, uh, a miracle. These are the eggs of one of our native silkworms, the, uh, the regal moth or hickory horn devil. That's a very cool animal. And even the eggs are beautiful. And there you see the larva hatching out of the egg. And there's an adult, uh, sorry, a mature hickory horn devil. I've only seen these a couple times. So how many people have seen those? It's not something you see every day. Uh, another thing I've learned as I get older. Thank your lucky stars when you see something like this. It might be the last time in your life you'll ever see it. I've seen them twice. I've seen wafer ashes twice. Uh, these are not something you see every day, but it's part of our native wildlife. And actually, it's a harmless creature. Hickory horn devil cannot harm you at all, but birds probably think that's kind of scary, and <laughs> children do too. I think most, most Americans would think it's the biggest caterpillar in the U.S. A lot of people would say, I'm not going to touch that. But it's actually totally harmless. <laughs> well worth holding gently and then letting it go along. It pupates in the ground. Unlike the other giant silkworms, it, it digs a hole in the ground, doesn't make a silk cocoon, and it's a very large pupa. Sometimes people will find those when they're dark gardening and they'll dig one up. A beautiful little creature. And it turns into this moth, the regal moth, which if you see one in nature, you are really, truly fortunate. Um, it's, it eats walnut and hickories as a larva. Again, it doesn't feed as an adult. And it's got a close relative, the imperial moth. And a friend of mine, Craig Fraser, took this picture. Uh, we don't see these things every day. This is one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen. It's got this purple and this yellow. Uh, and it's also in the giant silkworm family. Now this one I am proud of. This is a picture I took. And I raised this moth from a larva. And this is the female. She has smaller antennae. This is the male. So I put her out. And a wild moth came and mated with her. So if you, if you find these things in nature, if you find them, you can get some of her eggs by putting her in a paper bag for a night, let her lay some eggs. You don't want too many. And this moth 
only eats uh, sassafras and pipe spice bush, also like the, the spice bush swallowtail. There may be some other host plants. But if you have the eggs of this and you have a, a sassafras plant, you, can, you could raise the larva, get the cocoons, get the adult, and then put her out, and sh she'll draw a male to her. So I'm very c it's a very cool thing to do. I've only done that once in my life with a promethea moth. Another one of our giant uh, Saturnids is uh, the um, polyphemus moth with these big, beautiful eyes. I didn't take this picture, but I have raised these before. To me, that's one of the most beautiful things, that pink edging, that sepia, the gray, the blue, totally awesome, beautiful creature. And there's the larva. I did take this picture. I raised these larvae one year. To me, one of the most beautiful things on earth is a big silkworm moth, well worth raising them, and um, has these little silver spots, spiracles, uh, eats lots of different plants, hickory, oak, willow. And these are the antennae of the male uh, polyphemus moth, all the Saturnids, because the male has to find the female by her scent alone, her unique scent. And he uses these, these sensory organs. These are covered with little olfactory smell-sensing cells. And he can sieve out her pheromone through the air in the dark and find her by flying upwind towards her. They also have a kind of a wimpy defense, the Saturnias do. Uh, a Saturnian moth, uh, the, 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 the polyphemus moth will flip its body around, exposing these eyes, which he thinks will protect it from birds. But it probably doesn't. Uh, it's very wimpy defense. He's actually got no defense other than, here's my big eyes, <laughs> fake eyes. I actually, I have, this is a wing I found in my backyard. If a bird sees a polyphemus moth or a luna moth or a cecropia moth, it will strip off the wings and eat it. So I, that's one of the signs of nature. I found their wings loose in the yard where, where a bird caught it and ate it. This is a quote from Henry Thoreau, one of my favorite writers. He says, nature will bear the closest inspection. She invites us to lay our eye level with the smallest leaf and take an insect view of its plane. She has no interstices. Every part is full of life. Now, this is something philosophically I've thought. You go to a great hotel, a beautiful hotel, and then you go down their, their, land, their, uh, their stairway, their escape stairway. Often it's like really grungy. Have you ever done that? I tend to take stairs rather than elevators. And it's like, there's no attention paid to the stairway at all. You go into your house and your crawl space. What does it look like? It's not beautiful. But in nature, every feather, every insect scale, every cell, every leaf is beautiful. Nature doesn't take any shortcuts and like say, well, nobody's going to look inside and see what it's like. But if you go to most homes, there's some, like you look at the back of your refrigerator or the back of your, you know what I mean? It's like nobody paid any attention to it, but nature makes it all perfectly. Thoreau expresses that. And so this is the close-up of a polyphemus moth's eye. So there's that little eye spot in it. If you look at it closely, it's beautiful every which way. If you took one of those scales, it would be beautiful. It's just incredibly beautiful. And I've taken other pictures of, of butterfly wings. Each, each scale is filled with pigment or has a iridescence. It's just totally awesomely beautiful. This is um, a uranium moth, a tropical moth. It has little curled iridescent scales. To me, it looks like a stained glass window. You cannot look at nature and find any flaws in it. It's beautiful from top to bottom. Each cell in your body is equally beautiful, each little cell. Um, this is the head of a, a, a gypsy moth caterpillar, which most people hate gypsy moths up north. It's an invasive, exotic pest, which is, is hard on our forests. But uh, I took that one as a grad student. Its head is beautiful, just one caterpillar. Um, and this is a picture I did not take. This is encourage you to take pictures. With your cell phone nowadays, you might run into the best looking luna moth that anybody ever saw. That's a beautiful <coughs> luna moth. And some amateur took the picture. Uh, I may never see a luna moth that perfect. 